This is FRM part two, book two, credit risk measurement and management. And the second part of the chapter on CVA, wrong way risk. So as I go through this slide deck, I'm going to rely on your knowledge and your viewing and your reading of the first part of this chapter on credit value adjustments. I'll of course refer to it throughout the slide deck. In finance, we typically use terms like securitization and delta hedging and rehypothecation and heteroscedasticity, although that's a statistics term. And those terms probably were created by really smart men and women to kind of capture the essence of, of what those terms really mean. When I, when I first heard the term wrong way risk, I thought to myself, that sounds like something that I could have made up when I was in kindergarten or when I was 10 years old, wrong way risk. Um, and as I learned about this over the years, uh, I, I think I have a little bit of a better name, at least for me. And you'll see this as we go through the slide deck. Uh, I, I prefer to think of it as double risk. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what I mean by, uh, by an example. Let's suppose that in my backyard I have discovered oil and I have a barrel of oil sitting in my backyard and you're my neighbor and you're a farmer and you grow these awesome peaches. You remember that Seinfeld episode with the Mackinac peaches? So you have, you have these Mackinac peaches and uh, I'm looking over at your farm and I'm hungry and you're looking over at my barrel of oil and you're saying, you know, I need, I need energy to, to run my farm. So we agree in some kind of a derivative. <clears throat> Let's just call it a simple forward contract where we agree to trade a barrel of oil for a uh, hundred of these Mackinac peaches. So let's just assume a barrel of oil trades for a hundred dollars and these Mackinac peaches are a dollar each. And we agree to do this in three months or six months, right? So uh, what happens over time? The price of peaches rises and falls. The price of a barrel of oil rises and falls. But let's just focus on the price of a barrel of oil here for, for my example. So let's suppose that over the next month or two, the price of a barrel of oil increases dramatically, $200 to $300. Now, in an extreme case, let's also suppose that I have this barrel of oil sitting in my backyard and every day you get up to do your farming stuff and you can look and see my barrel of oil. And you can't wait to get your hands on that barrel of oil after the uh, contract matures. You can see the barrel of oil, right? That's an important part of this, uh, of this example. So the price of a barrel of oil goes up to $300. So this is good news for you because all you have to do is pay me 100 of these Mackinac peaches, which is, which is $100. So you're thinking, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Jim's barrel of oil and I'm going to immediately sell it and get $300. And then I'll worry about uh, uh, some alternative source of energy for my farm. So that's good news for you, bad news for me. But now let's take, let's take that extreme example away. Let's suppose that I build a fence and you can't really see that barrel of oil. And so you start worrying about what am I going to do with that barrel of oil? So let's suppose that for some reason I say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to sell it over there to my neighbor. I'm going to, I'm going to sell it now and get $300. So I have $300 now, but I don't have that barrel of oil. But you don't know that. So now what can happen as we go forward? Let's just suppose for some reason that the price of that barrel of oil stays at around $300. Well, all sorts of things could happen to me. I could have good luck. I could have good fortune. Suppose I hit the lottery for a billion dollars, right? Well, this is good news for you because you know that I have a billion dollars and I don't really care about a two or a three or even a $1,000 loss on the trading of my barrel of oil in the derivatives market because I'm so well off, right? So that reduces your default risk. On the other hand, on the other hand, suppose that, uh, and let's go ahead and, and, and just assume that something bad happens to me, like my house burns down or my family divorces me and they take all my money and move uh, all the way over there and I have nothing. Well, this is not good news for you because you now 
are doubly exposed, right? You have this exposure because I owe you $200 or, and on top of that, I am probably not going to be able to go out and buy that barrel of oil to pay you or to cash settle with that $200. That, that is wrong way risk, right? So that is the, the example where I have something bad happen to me. My default probability changes. Now, of course, the issue is wrong way risk is if my house burns down, right way risk is if I hit the lottery. Now, remember in that first example, I said you can look over and see that barrel of oil in my backyard. So there's, there's really no concern for you about right way or wrong way risk because you can see the barrel of oil. But of course, we don't really know each other if we're operating in the over-the-counter market, if we're trading any kind of derivative. You, you don't know where I live. I don't know where you live. You can't see this barrel of oil. And so the question then becomes is how can you quantify both the wrong way risk and the right way risk, trying to figure out whether I've hit the lottery or whether my house has burned down. And that's the second part of some of these, uh, of some of these learning objectives. But you should get the idea of what the definition of wrong way risk is. It's kind of a double, double bad news. You'll see this as we look through these learning objectives. So describe wrong way and right way risk. Well, I've, I've already done that. It's identify examples. Now we'll go through some specific examples, but I've given you a pretty clear example about wrong way risk. And then we need to talk about collateral here. Uh, of course, when you look at my, my barrel of oil in my backyard, that sounds like pretty good collateral to me. But suppose, suppose I put up a government bond for collateral and suppose we have a third neighbor who is a central counterparty who writes separate contracts with each of us. So we need to look at examples of that. And then look at the second to last uh, learning objective the various wrong way risk modeling methods. And this is what I was talking about just a moment ago about it's your job to try to figure out whether or not I've hit the lottery or my house has burned down. And the challenge, of course, is that you don't know me, you don't know where I live. But of course, if this is a financial institution and you've signed this derivative contract with, you know, let's say, Jim's financial institution, you can go out and do some good research and perform some due diligence on, is it more likely that I've hit the lottery or is it more likely that my house has burned down? And of course, you're going to do some good fundamental analysis by looking at my financial statements and maybe looking at my credit spreads. So let's go ahead and get into the slide deck, right way versus wrong way risk. All right, so let me read this first one to you here, and I'm hoping that this makes perfect sense with the example that I just gave you. Wrong way risk is the risk that occurs when exposure to a counterparty is adversely correlated with the credit quality of that counterparty, whether I hit the lottery or whether my ha house burns down. So notice that term in bolded, adversely correlated. So we bring in, you know, this term correlation coefficient. And this is why, this is why I prefer the term double, double risk rather than wrong way risk because what it does is it kind of doubles it, right? The existence of wrong way risk will increase the CVA, right? But the existence of right way risk will reduce the CVA. So th there's a really cool uh, slide and uh, illustration and graph in the chapter that gives an example of 50% correlation. And they draw some graphs and they explain some things. And their conclusion is, is, is that if you have a positive 0.5 correlation coefficient with wrong way risk, that kind of doubles the total default risk. But if you have a negative correlation of 0.5, that kind of cuts it in half. So that's wrong way risk and, and right way risk. So I, I guess the way I should think about this and explain it to you is that wrong way risk is kind of doubling the risk. Right way risk is kind of having the risk. Halving, halving, H-A-L-F-I-N-G, halving, however you pronounce that word. Cut it in half or double. Thanks for your patience with me on the way my brain works. 
Uh, all right, there we go. Wrong way risk results in an increase in counterparty risk and therefore increases uh, the CVA. Of course, I just said that. Go down to that last block point. Right way risk, on the other hand, exists when there's a favorable dependence. So, of course, that implies that CVA decreases. Let's take a look at some of these quick pictures here. Of course, wrong way risk, there, there's the upward slope, right? Change in exposure and change in credit quality. With right way risk, there's the downward slope, and that should make perfect sense. And then this is what I think about that independent case there. If, if you can see my barrel of oil in my backyard, that's an example of an independent case because you can see it, you can actually come over and touch it, right? And you don't really care if I hit the lottery or if my house burns down because there's that barrel of oil. And in fact, I guess that for it to be true independent, I'd have to come and put it like half on your property and half on my property so that you could always, you know, kind of reach out and touch it. All right, let's look at that learning objective where it asks us for examples of wrong way risk. Notice this is one divided by five. So we have, there are five good examples, and I think these are probably... Uh, really good exam questions, potential exam questions. If I were writing some questions, I would go through each one of these five. So let's do this kind of quickly. But keep in mind uh, the concept of the barrel of oil. Keep in mind the concept of correlation. And keep in mind the concept, at least in the back of our minds, that we have a neighbor over there, a third person, a counterparty who may or may not be interested in this. All right, so you're ready for a put option. So what do we know? Put option gives us the right, but not the obligation to sell some underlying asset at a fixed price. So let's consider uh, a put option on some underlying asset. It, it could be a share of stock, but it could be a barrel of oil. It could be almost anything. And the price of that underlying asset falls. But somehow the value of that underlying asset is tied into, look at a strong positive correlation with the performance of the counterparty. And so this is wrong way risk because you're delighted that the price of the underlying asset falls. So you're worried about default risk, right? But now, as I said before, we're layering that default risk into counterparty risk and wrong way risk. So now we have to worry about the counterparty's house burning down, right? So look at that circle point. As the option gets more and more in the money, the counterparty becomes less able to fulfill his or her obligation. And then, of course, we've got to worry about macroeconomic factors such as, you know, maybe interest rates or inflation. Of course, inflation in 2021 is a big topic, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. But here's the example that I like. And notice that we put this in in red. You know, suppose that this put option is written on, uh, you know, Jim's bank and Jim's bank stock price is falling, but there is there are problems in the banking industry where maybe there's lots of interest rate volatility or inflation or, or lots of these other reasons, but prices of all of the financial institutions are falling. So Jim's bank price falls, that's good for you owning that put option, but the counterparty is probably another financial institution. So the value of the counterparty is falling. Notice there's a strong, what does that say up there? Strong positive positive correlation between the counterparty and Jim's bank. And so this is no good. So owning a put option is a great example of wrong way risk. Always think of contagion in the banking industry. And that's probably, that's why we bolded this in red, because that's probably a good example for every one of these things here, including the next one of foreign currency transaction. So think about my example with the barrel of oil and, and the Mackinac peaches. But let's suppose that instead of, you know, just a boundary in between our two properties, there are there are two countries. So I'm in one country and you as a farmer are in a different country. And instead of trading oil for peaches, we're trading US dollars for some other currency, right? And so we have the same kinds of things. I mean, you're not going to be able to look in my backyard and see a pile of US dollars. But what you can do is you can take a look at me uh, who am I? I'm, I'm Jim, whoever I am. And you can take a look at the counterparty. Maybe that's uh, Tom's uh, financial institution. You can take a look at us and see what our financial situation is. 
And so this has everything to do with the foreign exchange market, which has implications for things like, okay, what are central banks doing? Uh, what is the relative inflation between the two countries? What is the relative purchasing power and general interest rates between the two, uh, uh, the two countries? And so what can happen is that, let's suppose that um, what's happening here in the United States is that the value of my U.S. dollar is depreciating, right? So instead of a barrel of oil, I'm giving you all of these U.S. dollars, but they're depreciating. So, and remember, we agreed to trade at a fix to $100, right? So I, I give you these $100 and you think, what am I going to do with them? I'm going to trade them for just a few of my, uh, of my domestic currency. So there's wrong way risk. And this is probably, this is probably more obvious on a macro level. You know, so look at the bottom arrow point down there for a U.S. bank increase in exposure plus increase in counterparties risk. So that's wrong. How about a total return swap? I love teaching these to my students. Let's look at the, the illustration at the bottom. So here we are. One bank is going to uh, pay the total return on uh, on something. And let's now that total return could be on like, you know, the S&P 500 index or uh, a portfolio of uh, of energy, like a barrel of oil and a gallon of gas and uh, and uh, and, a, and a liter of natural gas. I don't even know what you put natural gas in. But in this case, let's suppose that it's the total return on uh, the Metropolitan Bank bond. All right, so it's a total return on a bond. And what we're going to do is we're going to receive LIBOR plus 5%. So that's a floating rate. So we have a floating rate going this way and a floating rate going this way. But because that total return is on a bond, we need to worry about we, we need to worry about the quality, the credit quality of that bond. So if if the credit quality deteriorates, then that's going to coincide with an increase in the payment of those liabilities. And so you're hit on both ends. That's that's double risk there. How about credit default swaps? I love credit default swaps as well. So let's just remind ourselves what a, a CDS is. You know, I'm Jim and I, I own a bond and I'm worried about this bond, not the coupon payments, but I'm worried about this bond, the issuer making that one final uh, par value or principal payment to me. Let's just assume that's one thousand dollars. So that's default risk. I'm worried about the default risk. So I go over here and I ask somebody else. I say, hey, if in fact this issuer doesn't pay me my one thousand, will you pay me my one thousand? OK, so that makes a lot of sense. So um, I got this position in a credit default swap and I'm, I'm covered, right? If, if the issuer doesn't pay me, then I get paid by this other financial institution over here. But, but let's suppose that there's a correlation between those two financial institutions. So this, this issuer over here, they collapse and they can't pay me, but there's a perfectly one-to-one -one correlation with the performance of this institution over here. So they collapse and they can't pay me. That sounds like wrong way risk to me. And then the final example uh, in this chapter is a commodity forward. So that's what I was talking about with the with the oil and the uh, Mackinac peaches. Now, the chapter gives an interesting example on on right way risk, and I want to work through this slide, you know, pretty quickly, but it gives you a sense of of what how right way risk can have have the default risk, right? We're not doubling it with wrong way risk. We're going to cut it in half. So look at the circle point here. The producer, oil producer, decides to use some kind of a derivative to hedge 50% of its production by entering into a some forward contract or a swap contract. Could be a futures contract as well. So the producer agrees to sell and the dealer agrees to buy oil at let's just say $50 a barrel. All right, so what happens? So we do this over, you know, you know, let's say one year if it's a forward contract or if it's a swap, it could be one or two or three years of a tenure. So as, as, the, as the price rises to $100 a barrel per barrel, well, this is good news if I'm the oil producer because I have all this, I have all this oil underground and I'm thinking, yeah, let me get this on, out of the ground so I can sell it for $100. 
even though I still have agreed to sell it in this derivative market for $50. So because my cash flows are rising, because the price of a bear hole is rising, this is right way risk. And I've hedged 50%, so then I'm happy about it, right? So look at that last uh, arrow point. As such, the dealer's exposure is likely to be low when the oil producer, when that counterparty defaults. That should make sense. How about the second right way risk example on a call option? So we look at, re read those bolded words again. So this is what I was emphasizing earlier. Performance has a strong, po uh, strong positive correlation with the performance of the counterparty. So, so as the counterparty, as the option gets more and more in the money, well, that's good news for us if we own that call option. And uh, if, if in fact our counterparty has a strong correlation with the performance of the underlying asset, let's say it's a, it's a stock in a financial institution and the financial institution industry is doing really super well, so there's a big correlation, so then I don't really have to worry about it. So that's, uh, that's right way risk. Now, do you remember that conversation that you had in your undergraduate investments class and probably your graduate school days and, and even, in, uh, even in some of our conversations where we talked about standard deviation as a measure of total risk? So we have a portfolio of equity securities. We can compute its standard deviation. But what we know is that investors are going to own well-diversified portfolios. And so what's going to happen is that as you add stocks that are less than perfectly correlated to the portfolio, you're going to get a drop in standard deviation. And that's why we divide standard deviation into its two components, systematic component and unsystematic component, right? Systematic risk we defined as the variability in returns due to changes in macroeconomic factors, right? Uh, unsystematic risk we defined as variability in returns due to changes in firm specific factors, right? So what did we do? We know that owning well diversified portfolios virtually eliminates unsystematic risk. There's not much we can do to systematic risk other than select the beta of our individual stocks. If we want lots of systematic risk, we pick high beta. If we want low systematic risk, we pick, uh, we pick low beta. Well, that, uh, uh, that kind of a thought process applies right here. So look at the first and second block points. General wrong way risk is driven by macroeconomic relationships. So remember, can you guys see my hand out here? Correlation between the underlying asset performance and this counterparty over here, those correlations might be high because of macroeconomic relationships like interest rates and political unrest and all sorts of fun things. Specific wrong way risk is like unsystematic, specific characteristics of the counterparty or the transaction. So there are the two types of risk, the general and specific. So think of these, you know, kind of, we don't use the term systematic and unsystematic, but here we use the term general and specific. And so think about this here. So general wrong way risk should be priced and managed correctly. It may be detectable using historical data. We'll talk about that in just a second. And they can potentially be incorporated into pricing models. And so this would be a great Nobel Prize winning uh, endeavor to come up with an accurate and useful wrong way risk pricing model. We have capital asset pricing model. We have arbitrage pricing model. How about a wrong way risk pricing model? We're going to try to attempt to, to find that in the next couple of slides. So I like that green over there where we show you it should be priced and managed correctly. Specific wrong way risk, look at this, it should be avoided. Uh, you know, diversification may come into play here, but remember, you know, if I'm the oil dude in my backyard and you're the farmer over there, um, you know, we're, we're looking at each other and trying to trade. So, you know, it's in general, it ought to be avoided, but sometimes it cannot be avoided. 
it's hard to detect, right? You can't look over my fence and see whether or not I've hit the lottery or whether my house is burned down, and it's difficult to model. So those two columns there, those are super likely exam questions if I were creating questions based on these learning objectives. Let me give you just a little bit of my personal history about this. When I was back in graduate school in my PhD level econometrics classes, I, I had two of these taught by the same professor. And this guy was, he, he was, he was an amazing professor. And so he would come into class and he would say, okay, here's a model. I, I want you to go to collect data and come back next week with your results. And so we'd go and we'd all have our own ideas. And uh, I, I always, I, I love studying poison pill securities and that was part of my dissertation. So I would go out and collect all this data on poison pill companies and we'd all come back with all of our results and we'd be so proud of it. And he would look at it and he would throw it up in the air and say, okay, this is worthless because uninformative historical data. He'd say, how do you know? How do you know that the last three years is gonna help us for the next three years? So what do we have in bold? Extracting the underlying relationships is challenging. And then look at the second one. Boy, we, we go through so much of this time series, anal time series analysis and correlations and copulas, they, they, they may not help. How about misspecification, right? If I say, if I say something like uh, the return on firms that have adopted poison pills depends on the number of clouds in the sky, well, my professor would have just thrown that right out the window. So correlations, they can be almost anything. But if they're zero, that doesn't really mean that they are independent of each other. Ah, let's go back to my example. Remember I said, you know, correlations. So we can compute a correlation, but that doesn't necessarily mean causation. And if in fact that correlation is zero in the past, it doesn't mean it's going to be zero in the future. So look at that bolded. may be a cause and effect type of relationship, but, but, they, but they may not be. So we need to take a deep breath, right? Take a deep breath with me and we're going to say, all right, we're going to do all this stuff, but then we have to be uh, cognizant of these challenges. And then look at this third one here. I, I love this one because this one here throws everything up in the air. The direction of this, uh, this extra kind of risk is not always clear. For example, low interest rates might cause something, but high interest rate might also cause the same kinds of conditions. So when you're looking at correlations, okay, we're highly correlated when interest rates are high, but we're also highly correlated when interest rates are low, then we've got to scratch our head and go back to the goal line and try to figure out how we can get all the way to the other team's end zone. How's that for a quick football analogy? All right, how about collateral? So let's go back to my example. If I have that barrel of oil sitting in my backyard or halfway on your property and my property, that, that sounds like super collateral. But remember, that's probably not very realistic. So what might I do? I, I might put up a bond for collateral. You may put up a bond for collateral. And of course, if I put up a bond, it could be any kind of a bond. It could be, it could be a treasury bond, right? Or it could be, it could be you know, if I'm, I'm an energy producer, it could be Jim's energy bond. And so, of course, collateral is good, right? Of course, collateral is good. But what happens if, if I use Jim's bond as collateral and I hand it over to our neighbor right there, our third neighbor, and I say, here's my bond. It's currently selling at par value $1,000. Well, let's suppose that my house burns down, right? Now, the analogy for my house burning down for Jim's Energy Company, let's suppose my cash flows suddenly drop, right? Look at the third block point. But in cases where there's a sudden jump in exposure, collateral does very little because look, look, my house burns down or I have a tremendous drop in my uh, operating cash flows. Well, what's happening to the value of my collateral over there? Well, my bond w was worth $1,000 when I handed it over to the neighbor. Now maybe it's worth $400. Or maybe it's only worth two hundred dollars. So now I have no cash flows, and the, my collateral is no good. And you can't see this barrel of oil, so you're over there, and all you're doing is eating your mac and all peaches. And that's a great thing, right? We love the mac and all peaches, but that's really not helping you to manage this kind of risk. Although it was a good idea at first, the impact of collateral um, 
uh, can have dire consequences. And of course, what the chapter does is talk about this sudden jump in exposure. And the example is some huge currency de devaluation. If, if I'm Jim and my bond is denominated in US dollars and my neighbor is over there in some other country like, like uh, Canada, and so I have, you know, the, the exchange rate moves against the value of that bond. And so not only might you not receive that collateral, but remember you're in another country over here. So when the third party goes to sell it, there, there may not be anything left. So look at what we have in the bottom because it may not be received at all. Now, these central counterparties uh, have a particular exposure to wrong way risk because they rely so much on collateral. Of course, our third neighbor, he or she's not gonna get involved into our contract unless there's something in it for him or her, right? And that something in it is, of course, they'll charge a fee, but in order to facilitate the transaction, they're going to require collateral. And typically that collateral is based on market risk. So if I hand over this bond, that third party is going to look at, you know, the, the, the credit rating, maybe the price of the credit default swap. And of course, we'll look at the duration and the convexity of the bond. And so, um, what might happen is that the separation of credit risk and market risk may result in um, a scenario under which that collateral totally ignores wrong way risk. And this is particularly true for credit default swaps because we've got this possibility that there is a high correlation between and among all in the industry that writes these credit default swaps. And so the counterparties probably have exposures there. And so the challenge is to identify this wrong way risk as a central counterparty, and then to make sure that it's priced properly. So look at that last circle point. Uh, collateral posted, of course, carries wrong way risk. Members may post highly risky or illiquid securities. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, how about wrong way collateral? Well, this goes back to my example with the neighbor and my, uh, and my bond losing value here. So look at, look at this. We're going to do some kind of a swap where a uh, bank is paying a fixed rate over here. And let's just suppose there's no collateral, but this counterparty here um, uses a government bond as collateral. So as, as interest rates rise, well, that's good for the bank, right? Because LIBOR plus, plus the spread. So the bank uh, we're receiving, right? We're receiving the floating rate there. So that's good news for us. However, however, because the government bond is used as collateral, as interest rates rise, the price of that government bond falls. So the collateral does, uh, does less is less valuable, so that's called wrong way collateral. So let's get to this uh, learning objective on wrong way risk modeling approaches. So let me go back to my original example. It's up to you as the Mackinac peach farmer to try to figure out, to try to figure out whether I've hit the lottery or whether my family has divorced me and taken all my money and moved all the way over there. A couple of different approaches here. So the hazard rate approach is a stochastic process that's going to be based probably on credit spreads. So let's go back to my example. Let's suppose that I'm Jim and I'm this energy company and I have a bond outstanding and I have a credit spread. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate potential credit spreads. Think of a think of an interest rate tree, uh, this stochastic process. So it's going to be random, right? We're going to pick these kind of paths through some kind of a simulation. Maybe it's a Monte Carlo simulation, but maybe it's some other kind of simulation. And so what happens over time? My credit spread, it's going to sometimes widen and it's going to sometimes narrow. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to determine what that expected positive exposure. Remember that EPE from our CVA discussions in the first part of this chapter is we're going to compute that for all of these paths. And some of these paths are going to uh, be positive, right? That, that there's not going to be any default on my bond or my forward contract or whatever derivative it is. But there are going to be some of these paths that result in, um, in some kind of a default event. 
you know, this is relatively easy to implement, so we like this. Um, however, however, there may or may not be any kind of a strong correlation between the actual exposure and uh, the actual default. So that's a disadvantage. Uh, a second way is through a structural approach. Um, so what happens here is that we're going to um, structurally uh, approach this by looking at the dependency between the exposure distribution, and remember that was kind of a hump back in uh, the CVA modeling, and the counterparty default time. So we're going to hit these at these discrete intervals at uh, over the tenor of the swap or over the life of the derivative. And we're going to say something like, okay, structurally what happens at this time period, at this time period, and this time period, depending on that exposure distribution. And so what happens is that you either have a yes or a no. It's mapped separately into a bivariate distribution. And so the reason that we like this is that we can use these pre-computed exposure distributions that we may have uh, determined uh, based on history. We may have determined them based on some stochastic process, or we may determine them through some other method. But in order to do this, we need lots of information. And so look at the disadvantages that all relevant information is contained within that distribution. And that may or may not be realistic. A third way is to use some parameters that are going to link the default probability to the exposure using what the chapter calls simple functions. And so here's one that we came up with. Let's suppose that we have, uh, I'm Jim, right? I have this energy company, high portfolio value. So I'm, I'm, I own all of these different derivative securities out there, one of which is the Jim's portfolio and high portfolio value. All right, so that's good news, right? I'm on the winning end, but maybe I have a high credit spread. So we want to try to link those two parametrically to uh, come up with some model of determining the magnitude of, of wrong way risk. So we can use historical data to do this, with, which is true with all parametric models. Um, however, what we need to do is try to figure out, is this current portfolio relevant to what we're using in historical data? So that's, that's a problem with using historical data all the time. Now, the jump approach is what I described just earlier. Suppose we have this, what was that slide that said a few moments ago, 20% devaluation of the currency or some massive uh, downgrade in Jim's bonds. So we have a jump at default. Um, uh, the chapter uses the example, look at what we have in parentheses, a large corporate bond default is probably, now this is a global bond, right, is going to probably have an impact on the relative value of the currencies. How about that very last learning objective on the implications of central clearing on wrong way risk? All right, so we know this, we said this before, that the central uh, clearing parties, they have uh, super reliance on collateral, collateral as protection. Now, of course, they tend to rely on margins. And I always tell my students, uh, we, we talk at, at length about the, um, the futures markets and the futures exchanges that require an initial margin and a maintenance margin. Of course, this is true in the over-the-counter market as well. But then, but then there are those default fund contributions by all the members to absorb those potential losses. But those are based, once again, on market risk. So this is the challenge is that it, it may, and it's probably likely, but it may not, but it's probably likely that uh, this is going to end up uh, completely ignoring wrong way risk. So look at that third block point, particularly challenging to quantify wrong way risk for inclusion in the margin and the default fund contributions. Because look, I mean, essentially what you would love as a CCP, you would love to have a margin that's, you know, like this. So no matter what happens to the price, you're protected. But of course, 
you know, if, if your margins were this big, then there would probably be no liquidity in your market. So you want to squeeze it down to get the optimal margin, optimal meaning, you know, weighing the marginal costs and the marginal benefits. And so the concluding thought here is that that margin ought to include the marginal costs of wrong way risk. And I think that takes us through all of our learning objectives. So here, here's my advice on potential exam questions. If I'm writing these, focus on example, no, focus first of all on definitions of wrong and right, and right way risk. So I think we've done that. But now let's go ahead. Some better application questions are examples, identifying wrong or right way risk, and then layer that with collateral and then do the modeling methods.